Sharon Singh from Bennett Jones. I'm going to call you a stage. Merle Alexander from Miller Titterley. And Sandy Carpenter, the Canadian Regulatory and Indigenous Law. Could you come to the stage, please? And each of our guests and speakers will be sharing their perspective on the legal aspects of UNDRIP. I will be moderating this session. So what we have today is a presentation of uh, three uh, individuals who have been very involved in Aboriginal rights, Aboriginal legislation, Aboriginal uh, business, all aspects of Aboriginal engagement. I know some of you were very involved in the, uh, working on the UNDRIP legislation that was passed by the provincial legislature. And we're leaving it quite broad to where you see the legal aspects of UNDRIP and where we're going. We have um, many questions coming forward in terms of how this will be implemented across the province. There are questions around, um, um, are BC laws consistent with UNDRIP? How, how is this uh, legislation itself going to be workable with existing legislation federally, either Section 35 or the Indian Act? We've heard at times that the legislation is not compatible with existing legislation in Canada. There's a whole number of questions in there. So do you want to give us your perspective on how you see this legislation rolling out and how society will change? Well, we would spend an awful lot of time talking about those uh, questions. And first, I'd just like to thank Resource Works uh, for letting me participate um, in, in today's events. I'd like to congratulate the people who were involved in getting this legislation to where it is. It's a very significant achievement, um, and there's lots of hard work ahead, but uh, everybody who was involved should uh, get down. We can delve into some of the more detailed legal questions uh, around compatibility with the Canadian Constitution, uh, around federal laws. I don't think that we're talking about a major departure uh, from those. And, and I think that the people who uh, do suggest that uh, this legislation um, is a major departure from existing law uh, should spend some more time thinking um, and reading about uh, what this legislation is intended to do, um, reading about different people's perspectives um, on that. Um, what I think um, is perhaps the most significant part of uh, this legislation um, is simply the opportunities um, that it provides. Um, and one of the things that we talked about in forum this panel was what's the most powerful part uh, of the legislation and to me, uh, the sections that deal with the alignment of BC laws with what it is that the BC government and uh, the Indigenous leaders and Indigenous people of BC decide what it means in those contexts um, is that uh, most powerful section. Um, if this legislation achieves the reduction in discrimination lifting people out of poverty, uh, that is one of the primary goals of it, um, that has to be a sea change um, in this province. Um, but fundamentally, on top of that, um, BC has managed to create something that doesn't exist in virtually any other jurisdiction in the world. It was interesting listening to JP about the inability of Indigenous businesses to attract uh, investment dollars in Canada. Um, and I think if this legislation is used properly and positioned properly, that aspect of it can fundamentally change. Because for all those responsible investors out there, for all those people who are looking at ESG metrics, this is now one of a very small handful of jurisdictions in the world where you can say, we have legislation that requires our laws to be aligned with under. And if that can uh, attract investment capital into this province from responsible investors, uh, I don't know what can do. I hope we're not sitting in the echo chamber when we um, all agree at this time. But I do like that. I believe that it's all about your opportunity. I believe that this bill, the declaration after. Whatever you want to call it, 
is an opportunity to be truly transformative. Um, and it's just that, it's an opportunity. And it's all about any political action, and as I say political, it's not just our government as we know it, uh, Premier Morgan, it's also all the indigenous governments that exist. So it's, uh, we're truly serious about reconciliation, which uh, we can tell in BC that we are. This is all about internal governance between indigenous nations and how they choose to represent themselves and really some deep thinking at their levels about what does self-determination look like? What is it that we want to capitalize on from the 46 articles which are vast um, in terms of from under? And I know Mark, you asked a whole series of questions from I have a slightly different approach when you can ask about Section 35 and whether the provide is consistent. I believe we started off um, on Section 35 when I was introduced and I was just born, I, I know. But uh, really trying to reconcile the pre existing argument of rights uh, that existed by the sheer fact that while they were there before the Europeans arrived with our Constitution and Canadian laws. However, that sort of broad, expansive approach was narrowed through case law. So we, um, we're we currently looking at free contact rights, we, we look at asserted and established rights, we distinguish between the various aspects of African rights. What Dribba, when we wonder about it, that's quite a lot. What Dribba allows us to do is look at broadening that application. So I started off saying it's an opportunity, and it's an opportunity that really must be followed by political will um, to really inform the changes in our judiciary, inform the changes in our institutions, and inform the changes that we frankly would all like to see to get business done, be it business of healthcare, be it business of culture, be it business of language, or be it business of development. Hi. <clears throat> For all the standard, um, I acknowledge that the territory is the Swamish mostly and this led to the people um, for uh, speaking. I guess I will disagree. <laughs> like, I think like one of the like I think one of the most greatest dangers with, with implementing the Declaration Act is that the same process as the crew of Section 35, where industry and the crown make a conscious effort to narrow the interpretation of the act. Um, that is a big one sort of wins the day. I think that, like, as one of the um, technical team for the for development of legislation, I think what we very much had in mind and what our instructions from our political masters was, was to create an enabling political and legal instrument that would, would, which would call into question complacency with, with, with status quo. So I think, you know, the, um, I think the, the, the likelihood, the indigenous, I think what the most important, I think, discussion, I think, forward is finding a common ground on like what are the incremental and progressive steps that we can take forward now also being somewhat realistic about what, what can be achieved within certain timelines. Um, that's what the action plan is intended, is intended to do. It's a respect why, why individual uh, First Nations or, or individual or stakeholders will not define how the act will be implemented. It's, it's really, the, the legislation will be most empowered by what is that first wave of what displaced into the action plan. Um, and that process has yet to begin. That process is extremely important. I think that's why I think both uh, First Nations Leadership Council and both the province are identifying that as a key area that we need to get to work on. Then I think that give also, I think, the stakeholders a better perspective on like what, uh, what the act is going to look like in terms of its interpretation. Because, you know, I mean, the, I mean, the declaration the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples is not an economic treaty, it's not a resource treaty, it's a human rights treaty. So I know in the scheme of central world, we often sort of need to think, so well, how does this apply to me? Why is this so important to me? And that's in some respects where a lot of the, since the bill was made in the media, that's been sort of this very self-focused as though, 
what happens in, what happens to us as an issue, what happens to my project is sort of like been sort of almost dominating the conversation. I think you have to sort of realize that the New York Declaration of the Rights of the Citizens was not about China. It's a government to government, it was involved by indigenous governments, with, with states, it's an international human rights treaty, and I think that it has to be interpreted that way. Our priority, like indigenous First Nations priorities, may not end up being anything to do with resource development. So lots of the fear mongering, I think, that's currently going on about like, the fear of how the act will be implemented could completely be ill founded. But that conversation is common. All right, thank you for opening statements. Thank you. I want to just touch on what Merle brought up, saying that UNDRIP itself is a government to government. It's a relationship between government to government, yet uh, it has huge impacts on average companies, average people in a society. So Sharon, could I ask you, uh, what, what's the practical effect of legislation like this on people's day-to-day -day lives? As much as right now, it is government to government, First Nations to government. How does this affect these seniors? Well, once you're the fact that it is now going to be legislation, I think it affects all of us. It will, from, as Merle said, which I didn't hear your screaming. I heard screaming. Just my ears. I believe through the action plan, we will see how it will be implemented. So, uh, the fundamentals of the Declaration Act are obviously affirming the rights of the Indigenous people as they're found in the Declaration Act. They were setting forward and stuff, and uh, Chief Gerald said, in action plan to see how current legislation, looking at that, say, is it in compliance with UNDRA, looking at forward-looking legislation, ensuring that it's developed with participation of Indigenous peoples, and ensuring it's compliant with UNDRA. And there is also a report to the legislation to make sure there's some, basically, fire and bombs to uh, comply with. I was promised that I was not going to swear, so I'm trying very hard. And um, the, I think the, the crucial part where it dictates from 1962, which is uh, the federal bill, is really that uh, joint decision-making framework that's also enabled by the legislation. So um, on the child welfare piece, Doug had mentioned, and also the EA piece, there is an action plan for 2020 that's, uh, that's been implemented, being implemented. And we see really uh, that being foreshadowed and how it will affect us as, as citizens in our daily lives. So if we look at child welfare, it's really one of, uh, I mean, I'm the Indian Indian, right? So, uh, like, not the other thing. So, um, I can probably say this and get away with it. it, it child welfare has been number one priority for a lot of the chiefs that I've spoken to with, and a lot of just, frankly, people in, in communities. So, the government's addressing that. On the EA piece, which is more of an industry piece, we're looking at joint consensus uh, decision making, and we're looking at how greater public participation, how greater interest participation works into that. So the EA framework that the government has been working on, uh, again, the way that interest participation already will affect us and is affecting us uh, on a day to day basis as the action plan gets rolled out, as there's further consultation uh, with non indigenous people in Kodo, with indigenous peoples, we will see how it will permeate. Heritage, or are we do healthcare, or are we economics, our political structures. I, I do believe there it is just we to borrow a world's words from earlier because there's a transformational opportunity here, which um, will be solely not to say it doesn't affect us, not just from I call it industry perspective, but industry, but from a truly human perspective as well. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. You can see up on the screen. I'm going to direct it. I'll give you advance warning as the panelists. The top two we're going to go through. Um, and I'm going to leave this open to who would like to present first. We know that FPIP is not a veto. I, I would state that that was stated by the Deputy Minister, but I do know that there are some people who do believe it is a veto. Does that mean governments can make decisions without receiving consent? And how is this different from consultation? I mean, uh, the regional chief of the BC Assembly of First Nations says very pointedly that. The consent is not vetoed. I think in part that's, I mean, I think there's, there's agreement on that. The consent is a process, as, as Deputy Minister Call had said. I think the involvement bill, I mean, it's probably, I mean, trying to anticipate that there will be disagreements um, and basing the entire implementation process upon that is probably like destined for failure. 
I think, like, I think in terms of like the circumstances where consent cannot be achieved by negotiation, I think that we do need to invest more money, as was suggested by by uh, Supreme Court of Canada and Kaya in 2004, that we develop a specialized commission that can deal specifically and has the expertise to deal with Indigenous rights related disputes. So I actually think that there is, a, there is, and there actually has been in parallel, actually, a lot of discussion on the First Nation side of the development of an Indigenous commission that could actually have that level of sort of specialty. So I think you know, we just, you know, when it comes to circumstances where where uh, consent cannot be achieved, I don't think the First Nations will accept the, the mere consultation any longer. And we need to draw from the smart thinking that is out in the wisdom that is out there to try and use an alternative dispute resolution mechanisms to the national because we have not been doing that today. If, if that was one of the first institutions that was created implementing this act, I think that would, that would fair everyone much better. We have to take these disputes out of the courts because they're not serving us well. Uh, I'll directly answer this. I believe from what the government has said that the actual uh, winter says that it doesn't equate with you know, what does that mean? If you look at what the government has said, how they're implementing you know, through the EA uh, format, currently there's consensus seeking, right? So what you're looking at, and I'll leave the words from our authority to all that things permeated, is that states shall consult and cooperate in good faith with indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions to achieve that thing. So I think the crucial words that always get this down at the are at the front end. Consult and cooperate in good faith. To me, at faith doesn't mean veto, and I know uh, our other legal um, advisors have said, well, you know, if consent gives you a right to say no, well, what is that? Let me give you two different perspectives. One, as indigenous owners, or as just owners of the land, consent does require your ability to say yes or no on what, what happens to your That's one. The other is, if you're being consulted and you're seeking consensus in the approach, as the pro has said, there has to be the ability to say yes, no, but government has to continue on to do what they must do, and which is, I think, the Article 46, essentially, which is a uh, more proportionality clause of a good trip to really um, do so in the public interest. So the EA framework, as is rolled out to be in compliance with, uh, I think, in compliance with the already gives us an approach to say, where are we going to see consent where it will equate the word veto, which is joint decision making, where are we going to see consensus, uh, a consensus approach where it doesn't mean if the nation say no, the project won't proceed. So, I mean, that's, I, I take two different approaches to it depending on the circumstances, depending on how we roll out the EA and whether the government chooses to enter into decision making based on joint decision making, or whether they choose to just simply do a consensus making approach. Um, and I'll just add a couple of comments because I think we're in final agreement uh, on this one. Uh, consent does not mean a veto, and for anybody who has not done their homework by reading the seven days or so of uh, cross examination of Minister Fraser that took place as Bill 41 was going through the legislative process. Uh, you should take the opportunity to at least uh, look at some of that because uh, Minister Fraser has taken through every provision of Bill 41 and every provision of UNDRA, asked for his perspective on those, and I haven't counted up the number of times he said consent is not a veto, but there are lots of them. And uh, what we have to remember for this is UNDRA is an international declaration. But Bill 41 is BC legislation, and Bill 41 will be interpreted partly according to Canadian law. It may have some international influence on it, but what the government intended when it passed the legislation, as expressed by Mr. Fraser, will be a significant aspect of that. And I also think we're in a strong agreement on. There is going to be, I think, probably quite a difficult transition from where we've been, because we've now been at this for more than 25 years in terms of consulting within the framework of Section 35, 
what we've been consulting on, how we've been trying to minimize the impact uh, on rights, how we've been trying to respect titles, how we've been trying to accommodate. Um, and that is the potential to change in consent-based discussion. It provides an opportunity for the parties to move beyond. Let's just talk about uh, the impact on our traditional rights. But for decision makers who have been used for that world, and where our legislation and processes are written around that world, that's a difficult transition for it to take place. And, and I'll give one example. Um, in the new BC Environmental Assessment Act, which is being held up by the government as this is what legislating in the context of UNDRA looks to us, there is a section in it that says if, based on the preliminary view, there are significant effects to a proposed activity, then that can be referred to uh, the minister, and the minister can make a decision to terminate that assessment, just not go any further. Well, there may be situations where an indigenous group goes, I get it, I get that there might be significant impacts here, but for other reasons, I want this um, activity proposal, whatever it may be, to take place. And that type of thinking still isn't even incorporated within an act that, in theory, was prepared. So there's still a lot of history uh, that is uh, governing how we look at stuff. There's still lots of history that, that reflects in our thinking. And this gives us that opportunity to break out of historical thinking. Okay. We have three minutes. I'm going to pose another question. And I'm going to pose to Sharon. It was up on the screen. Who decides if consent has been reached? Let me take this uh, in two ways. So, again, we've discussed the veto and consent question. And I think that what this question is trying to get at um, is essentially from a indigenous governance perspective, who provides the consent? So, if it's the CE approach, at least that's the way I get it. And I would say it's really up to indigenous peoples to decide with their own governance systems. And if we, you know, I'll, I can't tell you what you need to do internally to, and who you're going to nominate to be your speakers, whether it's director, whether it's the Indian Act, whether it's whatever have you. Um, if I did, I mean, not only a speaker, but I'm a presumptuous. So that's up to you to decide in terms of which, which processes, which governance structures. And again, I started my comments by saying there's a lot of internal uh, thinking that needs to be done by these people, and uh, uh, some have done it. So. But it's, it's a spectrum, and to see what is it that you want uh, in terms of how you would like to be represented. If you look at the Coastal Gas Lake decision that came out on December 31st, maybe I shouldn't throw that one out there, but I did. So it's, it's like a mic drop. Um, you know, it, it speaks to the, uh, the contention that is in some of the communities in terms of who's going to represent them and who's going to speak to them. So the, the, Jerba is almost a two-way sword. A sword. It provides a lot of rights, but it really requires a lot of work to be done by some of the nations that might not be there in terms of take all the uh, rights and all, all the opportunities that present themselves. So who, who decides consent? Uh, from an industry perspective, that's really up to you to decide. From the EA framework, um, I think it's, it's really meant to be a joint decision-making, joint consensus approach. And I know the uh, alternative dispute resolution process is still being worked out, but again, that's amongst the nations to decide. And, uh, and with government to government uh, relationships, not, not for lawyers to really determine at this stage. Yeah, well, I just want to say, I think like, the, the act does sort of spell out who would give that consent. I mean, is it, one is a government to government agreement, it's part of like a legislation, so it would be really what I would call mutual consent. So I think the problem is still happening. So like body and he has to give you a um, So the, the problems will still happen, still a little consent, but then I think the indigenous, the applicable indigenous governing body is looked to to be the empowered entity to give consent also. And that requires us to take a closer look at the applicable indigenous legal orders and determine whether or not the Indian band elected leadership and regulatory leadership and reconcile that discussion over that part work needs to be done. And the act is actually sort of called upon that as part of that could very well also be part of the initial action plan is flushing out by regulation who is the appropriate indigenous government body. 
All right, a complex topic, lots of questions. There's some other great top questions in there. I can't get to them all, we can't do them here. I would like somebody afterwards to approach these individuals and ask them what happens in this case of multiple First Nations, not all First Nations give their consent, what happens? But I haven't got time to ask that now, so they'll be here at lunch. Thank you to all of you.